Daniel uh, Friedrich. I'm going to talk to you in the next 30 minutes or so about uh, seasonal variation and heat demand and what we can do about it. So first I'd like to show you what the problem is and tell you why I care and hopefully why you care at the end as well. Then we go through some methods which we can use to alleviate the seasonal variation heat demand. And then at the end there's a bit of work I'm starting to do which is a bit my own opinion and see where that brings us. But just a, a quick question at the beginning. At the moment, everything, well, most is focused on electricity. Does anyone know what the percentage in the total energy used in the UK of electricity is? No one? 10%. Slightly more. Mm -hmm. it's, in the UK, it's about 20%, uh, 25% in the UK, Scotland, about 20%. That's electricity. <coughs> the rest is transport, and about 50%, a bit more in Scotland, is heat. So it's definitely a big problem and it's definitely something which we need to focus on about in the next years or decades. Well, this is some data from the national grid where we have this turkeys or cyan line or whatever color is, is the electricity demand over the last four years in, uh, in, on a daily basis, so it's terawatt hours per day. So it fluctuates around one terawatt hour per day, slightly lower where the weekend dip slightly more in winter with the dip around Christmas, but that's about one terawatt hour per day. Then we have the black line, which is the total gas use in the UK. So this includes gas for power plants, for chemical industry, so that's the, everything. So then we have the green line, which is the non-daily metered gas. So all the power plants and chemical industry, they are daily metered. So then there's the gas which is non-daily metered, like most people's homes. You only give your gas consumption every month, every three months. So this green line is a good proxy for the heating demand in the UK. And you can see there's a vast swing between summer, where this is the baseline, which is basically hot water, which you need throughout the year, and then there's space heating, which is in winter. So there's a huge scale difference between these two, and it's much, much bigger than the electricity. So that's something we need to do about it. Blue line at the bottom just for reference is the wind energy in the UK also in Terra Hills today. It's still quite small, but probably expanding quite significantly, significantly in the next years. So going a bit closer to the, the non-daily metered gas, so that depends on the strongly on temperature. So the your heat, you want to put up the heat in your house if it's cold outside. And there we have the green is still the non-daily metered gas, and the red is the temperatures that's so I think I use Edinburgh temperature. But, uh, uh, you can see that like, the inverse relationship between these two. And the, the top figure is the non-daily meter is about 480 terawatt hours in 2012, which is about 10% of the deck figures for space heating. So it's the first approximation. It's quite good. So uh, this is roughly what we need to cover if we want to be completely renewable heat. So up to now, the conventional energy system is when we have our demands, you know, heat demand, electricity, and transport, they're fairly separated. And they're all obviously, Win Rampin showed that in his inaugural lecture. If you haven't seen it, it's on YouTube as well. So that we definitely we need to have the instantaneous match, at least for the electricity, between the fluctuating demand and the supply. So this is done at the moment we have our what I call the very long-term energy storage from the biomass from millions of years ago got stored as fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas, and the nuclear as well, which we use as patchwork energy. So once we use it, we need electricity, we use it reasonably similar for the heat demand. So it's mainly mainly gas in the UK, but in some other cases it's oil and coal and a bit of electric electricity for heating. This is how our heating system or our energy system looked like 10 years ago. It's moving a bit more, so we, on the <coughs> supply side, we have more and more renewables, which are fluctuating, so we need to do something about it. And not just for electricity, but also for heat. <coughs> so that brings me to the heating. So I hopefully showed you that it's a, it's a large challenge. There's large variations. Not, uh, electricity fluctuates slightly. Heating fluctuates by, uh, from, I think it was about 0 0.7 terawatt hours per day to about 3. So it's a factor of three or four difference between summer and winter. So, and so we have very large scale, which is definitely one of the challenges that we have to overcome. But it's also one of the big opportunities, since everyone needs heat, at least in this country. So we can have distributed heat and 
terminality storage can be very efficient so we have very high round trip efficiencies and it can be reasonably cheap so on a per kilowatt hour basis it's about an order of magnitude or more cheaper than uh, battery storage I think uh, I don't know the numbers but, but uh, pump hydro so. and obviously if we can integrate this better with the renewables Renewables are also a very distributed energy source. So we have our wind parks all over the country. We can have solar on every roof. And so that might match quite well with the heat demand. There's a few more, more challenges. So there's the lack of good demand data. As I said previously, your heat demand is only measured every three months. So you don't know what happens now on the Monday morning in the first week of January. So we don't, we have a rough idea. So there are some models, but they're still not uh, as good as it could be, and it's definitely not as good as all the electricity demand. And the, the, the integration, which is one of the opportunities, also one of the challenges. How do we do that? How do we go from the system we are currently to a system which is a more holistic view of electricity, heat, and transport? So, currently, uh, most houses now only have a com uh, combi boiler which runs natural gas. It's a very reasonably efficient system, so the boiler, well, they claim 95% efficiency, probably in real life it's closer to 90%. Um, the user has control of the heating, so you can just uh, turn up your boiler when you want your heat. It's reasonably flexible, they're quite robust, the boilers are not too expensive. Gas is reasonably cheap in this country as well, but people might tell you otherwise, but in comparison to other countries it's not that expensive. Um, so, most people are quite happy with the system they have. So, they don't want to change, so that's one of the social problems that I'm in, in talk with the people in uh, social political science and how we can address this issue of uh, getting the users on board because if we don't get them on board, then it's not going to work. Currently, everyone is chucking out their hot water tanks to get more space. Might be not as crucial on the rural area, but in London or so, every square meter of space is quite valuable. So they have to check out the tanks, but ideally, we would like to put more tanks in the new, in the people houses. So, this is where we are. Somewhere on storage, so there's some estimation that there's still about 40 million hot water tanks, which have a combined storage of 80 gigawatt hours, which is two times the pumped hydro storage capacity <coughs> we have in the UK. I'm not sure how reliable this number is, but this gives you an idea of the scale we have at the moment, and maybe we can increase further on, and then we have something which is quite significant in the wider scale of things. So we just 80 gigawatt hours. So if we can double or triple that, that's quite significant in integrating the renewables, the variable, varying renewables into our energy system. So. <coughs> Currently heating natural gas, so we would like to decarbonize it, so reduce the equivalent CO2 intensity of this. There's a few things of the, we have to probably do all of them, so one of the first things should be insulate buildings, so reducing our heating demand. <coughs> it's going down slightly in recent years, but not as fast as the government projected up to 2020, and the rebuild numbers in the UK are quite low. I think there's only a few percent of the housing stock is rebuilt. I think only one percent roughly of the housing stock per year. So, if we're waiting for that to happen, that we will not drive down our heat demand. So then there's the mindset management where we need some storage to shift the heating demand from the hours when we would like to have our hot showers and our heating on to hours where we have either surplus electricity in the grid or there's sunshine. So that would be, there's options for individual houses for integrating into wider district heating networks. This is done quite extensively in Denmark. I think there are about 60% of the houses on a district heating network. But they started from a completely different situation than in the UK at the moment. So they basically didn't have very much district, uh, natural gas distribution networks. So in the UK, if we go to all district heating, then you know, the natural gas network is not used. and then. Who's paying the cost for that? Do we want to support two networks or just one? So there's it's different different problems and different starting points in Denmark and the UK. But district heating is one option where you can have uh, district heating pipes which produce, which give you the hot water into your house and the heat is produced in a 
district energy center. The nice thing about this is you don't need to replace hundreds of boilers, you only need to replace one boiler in the district heating center, which you could run on biomass, biogas, you could have solar collectors, um, heat pumps, which where you could have water heat pumps, which are you know, next to lake or the sea. So there's this, you only replace one, but not each and your houses. So, but the problem is getting the heat source. And I will look in a bit at, at solar in the next couple of slides. So, if we want to shift it from somewhere, the energy should be reasonably low cost or free. And solar, the solar resource, if we have the solar collectors, once the collectors are there, we get the heat basically for free with a bit of maintenance and replacement. But there's a clear mismatch. So, this is on the daily basis and this is on the monthly basis. So, the daily, where the, obviously the solar peak is when the sun is tightest around lunchtime and the heat demand is basically usually for working people in the morning when they get up and once they come back from work in the evening. So we need to do a shift to so daily storage. So this is a cycle, less than 24 hour storage, and we do that every day. So we have about 350 to more cycles per year. If we want to look at the, at the seasonal, basis, we have the more solar in summer, but we need the heat in winter. So how are we doing that? So we need to store this hump to get everything here and this. So we need to store for up to seven months and there's only one cycle per year. So it's not a very good utilization of this. As, as Wim Rumpen said, so to make this viable, we basically <coughs> need to ideally use local dirt as a storage material. So I now will look into this in a bit more detail. So this is the red one is the daily heat demand for a two-figure house in Edinburgh. And the blue one is the solar radiance in, in Edinburgh. It also is, shows you that we have the winter where we need more heat and we have much less solar energy. So we just use a, a daily total energy storage. So it was a very simple model where we just store the energy for one day and use it. And then look at what happens to so how many square meters of panel area we need per house. So we have, so this is the, the fraction. So the solar fraction can go up to around 90% for with the daily storage, but then we would need 140 square meters per hour house. So something more realistic in, in the district heating networks in Denmark or Canada is about 40 square meters per hour household, which is still quite a lot. So obviously, the higher your panel area, the higher your solar fraction goes, but then the used solar fraction goes down. Obviously, if you have the 140, you need that to fulfill your demand in winter, but in summer, you need to dump all that heat. So we need to find some balance. So we need something which is the daily storage, in this case, doesn't cut it, so we need to store for longer periods of time. So, but if we want to do that, we would uh, require about 25 square meters of thermal collectors per UK house, about 6 megawatt hours of heat storage. So it would, nationwide, we'd need over 100 terawatt hours of storage, which is quite significant number. And I don't know how far we can get with this with, uh, with seasonal heat storage. So there's a few heat storage technologies, and I will give some examples from uh, around Europe and Canada of these, unfortunately not the UK since we don't have that many. And so the three technologies are sensible heat, which is basically heating up the substance, could be water or rock or gravel. Latent heat is the phase change, so the most common one you know is water to ice. And thermal chemical storage. So these are ranked in order, so the energy density increases from one to three. The heat losses decrease, but the costs increase quite significantly as well. So we look at uh, long-term sensible heat storage. We need low, low dip cell discharge. We're storing this thing for five, six, seven months. So if it uses quite a lot of energy every day, it's not going to work. So we want to have something big. So we reduce the, uh, the surface to volume ratio 
surface only goes up with the square, not the size, while the volume goes up with the cube, so we want to have something very large. So usually it's larger than about 1,000 cubic meters. And there's different technologies, especially the tanks. Um, these are basically just pits, which have some, sometimes it's free standing, sometimes it's a floating insulation layer. Um, so these are the, the, the tank and pit storage. So we have borehole storage, where you basically just drill some pipes into the ground, which go in loops, and you flow hot water through, which heat up the ground during the charging period, and then you can hot <coughs> water the other way to discharge during the discharge period. <coughs> and the fourth option is aquifer where we drill into a uh, aquifer underground, which is a water-carrying layer, where we then, during, so during summer, we will heat up one, one, so there's a well drilled here, so it's a hot well and a cold well, but we can, the aquifer has a benefit that we can have one hot and one cold, so we can use it for cooling in summer and heating in winter, which is done quite extensively in the Netherlands. And one thing is, the efficiencies of these, the round trip from charging to discharge is only about 50% for most of them. So we lose about 50% of energy, so we really don't want to use fossil fuels or anything, so we want to use a renewable source, either solar or um, heat generated through, through the electricity from wind or wave power. So a few examples, so this is from, uh, from Denmark. I think it's one of the biggest, when, if not still the biggest pit storage, so it's 200,000 cubic meters, so this is a bit down here. And there, there are fields of solar collectors. So this is for, yeah, for a scheme of about 2,000 customers, and it provides about 50% of the annual heat. So it doesn't get you to, to the 100%, so they're topped up with, uh, with heat pumps, and with, uh, I think, biogas more or less. Well, so, this is quite a large scale, but it gets us somewhere, but still not to, to the 100% we need. So the Danish, they work quite a lot with uh, the, the gas boilers getting replaced by biomass boilers to do the top up, to go from the 50 to a higher percentage. <coughs> this is one of the aquifer storage. This is from the Netherlands. I think this is the, uh, it's a terminal in Amsterdam. So. As I said, so they have the aquifer thermal storage where you get one cold and one hot well. And this is quite nice if your heat and cold demand is very reasonably normal. So they have a cooling demand in summer and the heat demand in winter. And this roughly both of roughly 8 uh, megawatts power rating. So by combining this with decentralized heat pumps, does everyone know what a heat pump is? <coughs> Anyone doesn't know what a heat pump is? Okay, it's basically uh, a reverse refrigerator. So we, you, you take ambient um, energy at, at a cold level, you compress it, and then so you basically upgrade the heat from, you can do it from the air, from water or ground, and basically for one unit of electricity, you usually get about three units of heat out. So this compares to a resistive heater, which has uh, roughly the one unit of electricity is one unit of heat. So that's even more efficient heat pump, but roughly the three is the value most people get. So this gives us basically low grade heat, which is then decentrally upgraded with heat pumps. And storage delivers about yeah, 2.5 gigawatt hours of heat and cold per year. So the cold is charged in winter, the heat during the summer, and then in the other season it changes. <coughs> and the interesting thing to note. The Netherlands, the last time I checked, had over 2,000 different <coughs> aquifer storage systems in place. So it, their geology is quite suited to this, but they built it from small commercial buildings to the universities to areas so there's about 2,000 around. I think in the UK we have two. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly different scale. And the last example is the, is the Drake Landing Solar Community. So it's a purpose-built community of 52 houses. They're quite energy-efficient houses, so they have a heat demand of 12 megawatt hours, and they have 5,000 degree days, so it's much, much colder in winter than in Edinburgh. And the average space heating demand in the UK is about 15 megawatt hours. So these houses are properly insulated. Uh, they have about 
40 square meters of solar collected per dwelling. We have a couple of, uh, in the energy center, there are some short term storage tanks, and then there are the borehole storage. This is the ones with the pipes going through the ground, which heat up basically your local dirt underneath you. So it's crucial to have the buffer tanks since this borehole storage tank has quite slow inertia. So you can't get the heat out very quickly. So if you have a high demand winter day, you need to have your, your short-term storage primed the night before. And the interesting thing about this is they get a solar space heating fraction of almost 100%, which is uh, quite impressive for the amount of heating they require there. And the efficiency of the wall storage is very hard to estimate because you can't really measure all the temperatures in the ground and it's, it's changes from year to year. So it's between <coughs> 35 and 55 percent. So you only get about half of the energy you put in back out. And as I mentioned before, the interplay between the buffer and the long-term storage is really crucial. And this is something uh, Rinaldi will look into a bit more. He's sitting in the back somewhere, it's my PhD student. He will go to Canada next year for three months and use our models on the system to see how we, if we can improve the interplay between the short and long-term storage, looking at weather forecasts and temperature forecasts to see when we have to charge the short-term storage and when we don't have to. So this is some work he will work on next year. And I will give a bit of overview. I think he spoke a few weeks ago. So um, if anyone is bored, just let me know. So, Renaldi is working on an optimization model which is basically uh, quickly to run, so it's like a reduced order, but which we can run before we do very in-depth complex studies. So, so you do a pre-design study which is more or less done on the back of an envelope or in, uh, on paper, and then you do a detailed simulation study with transits or sort of a high level software. So we want to sit somewhere in between where we have a reasonably simple model which we can optimize over quite wide range of configurations. And then this, this will feed in the detailed simulation and then hopefully look at a wider wider range of components <coughs> and operational systems and all. So this is still quite tricky enough. So it's, uh, it's a dynamic, so we need to you know, charge short long-term storage. There's varying renewables and varying demand to take into account. So it's like dy dynamic and couple. There's multiple time scales. The seasonal storage you only charge basically mostly during the summer, while the short-term storage you charge and discharge every day. So we need to take up care of multiple time scales. And we might look at ones of different complexities to see which one gives us sufficiently accurate results while not having too high of the computational complexity. So as a as a start of this, we look at not just the disk heating, but we look at the, at the single house first. So it's Reasonably simple system, so we just have a demand model. We have uh, used heat pump, some storage, and just try to optimize the system for the operation to see if we can get better results than a gas boiler. So Rinaldi came up with a synthetic heat demand model. Hard to see. Uh, the red one is the temperature, and the blue one is maybe the instantaneous uh, heating demand, which is around up to what, 8 kilowatts. So this synthetic heat demand model only requires the annual consumption and the outside temperature and the occupancy profile. I mean, the, the heating system is only active if people are in the house. Um, with this, <coughs> with the operational optimization, which is this is for a winter day, so the heat demand is the red curve here. There's no one in between nine and five, and then the heat pump runs. So at night we charge our storage. And then during in the morning and in the evening we discharge the storage. So we sort of we shift some of the demand from the on peak hours to the off peak hours. And for different um, different tariffs, we get this is the cost over 20 years for a gas boiler, which is obviously much lower than for a heat pump system with terminal energy storage, since the investment costs for the heat pumps are quite high, and you don't save that much for these type of storage sizes. But if we include the renewable heat incentive from the, from the government, we get roughly to comparable prices. So we, in the end, we get to comparable prices and we get with the current grid intensity, 
we get about 6 or 7% uh, CO2 savings, which is not very good. But if in the future the electricity grid is more decarbonized, so really these number will drop down as well. And the single dwelling innovation is then integrated into the district heating. So in the district heating, we will have a number of houses with different occupancy profiles, eventually different uh, different heat demands. And since uh, some people like the house slightly warmer, some people have slightly colder, so there's there's small variations to integrate. There's the different time scales I previously spoke about, so the short and long-term storage, the fluctuations in the renewables, and different complexity <coughs> models, something we look at. So for the storage, you can have just a one, so that's just a long parameter model, or you have a 1D model where you have stratification in the tank, where you have slightly hotter <coughs> the top, slightly cooler in the bottom, which is more makes your solar thermal collectors run more efficiently if your tank is stratified, or the full two or three D model. 3D model for the tank. So there's different complexities, something which we are going to look into in the next uh, months, next couple of months. So, I already spoke about this in the UK. We've got Pim Liquid Tower, which is basically a short term storage for just the heating network. It's been around, in operational since the 70s, I think, with minor maintenance that's still working. And there's a few um, aquifer storage tanks aquifer storage systems in London. But that's basically it. So not many more and there's huge scope. So if the Canadians can deal with even colder winters, it should be possible in the UK to do it. The solar radiation in the spot in Canada is basically the same as in London. <coughs> While we need much less heating in the south of England than they do in Canada. So this basically is sensible. So let's move to some alternatives. There's the phase change materials, chemical storage, there's the sorption storage, we can do power to gas, I don't need to say much about this since Dimitri covered that quite nicely last week. And, uh, and there's biomass, and then there's geothermal waste, waste industry, these things I'm not covering today, uh, but they are options, but they are localized so you don't have, you, can, you can't use geothermal energy everywhere. If you want to have waste, heat from industry, so that's highly localized to where this industry and also the from landfill. So phase change materials, it's as I mentioned, ice is the best example. So you can so the energy you require to melt ice is about 330 kilojoules per kilogram. Heating water by 10 degrees is only about 42 kilojoules per kilogram. So in the phase change, you can have a much much higher energy density than to by just heating up the material. So it's basically this diagram. So if we just heat up a material, this would be stored energy. If we have a phase change, this is a gray box, we can have much, much higher energy density of the material. Uh, there's a local company, Sunland. They build a Sunland PV, which is basically integrating your solar panels with phase change material. But their costs are about 270 pounds per kilowatt hour. I think they're quite cost competitive in the industry, but they're still too expensive for long-term storage. Obviously, there's, there's some potential for short-term storage. So if we can replace our hot water tank from the houses with this, which has, if you include all the pumps and special equipment, has about four or five times the energy density than a water tank, we might go up from about 80 gigawatt hours to 200, 300 gigawatt hours, which then is quite significant in the wider integration of things. Um, thermal chemical storage, this is actually where I come from when I started here, I was working with Stefano on adsorption and adsorption if you have a kind of a reversal reaction, so you have your, normally it's a dehydration, so A or B will be water, if you have a, it's reacted to A or B, you heat, you can separate them, so you basically separate your, your dehydrate the material and then you could store A if you remove it from B for ever, basically, if you don't have ingress of B, <coughs> so that there's no losses, but you have higher material costs, you need the reactors, you need the containment vessels, so there's, there's a few other issues. So the energy density can be about, some people think about 10 to 15 times higher than your sensible heat storage on a, on a volumetric basis, but for long-term storage, again, it's 
very expensive, so you wouldn't want to do that to do one cycle per year. So you would, do, would like to do multiple cycles. So that might be something which people in London might be able to put into their, you know, their loft or in their bench or on their washing machine instead of the big water tank, have something like this, and still have the storage there. So these are actually the, the Chomo storage system. So now we could do, we have a good gas grid. Why not use spare electricity to generate synthetic natural gas or hydrogen? So Dimitri spoke about this, but there's, I just put some efficiencies in here. So electrolyzers, I got them from the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany, they were 75% to split up water into hydrogen and oxygen. Unfortunately, the natural gas grid has a very strict limit on hydrogen in it. I think it's about uh, half a percent in the UK. Some European countries go up to two five percent. But we could methanate it, then we lose another 15% of the efficiency in that step. So it is, this is good potential. So the natural gas grid has a storage capacity of around 50 terawatt hours. So which we can store, as Dimitri spoke about the offshore of oil and gas fields to store methane. Then we have the Russian gas grid, the distribution transmission lines, which are already there pre-pressurized at night to cope with the, the peak in morning demand. Uh, but there's quite a lot of um, storage in there. And the transmission network has quite low losses. I believe they're lower than in the electricity transmission network. So uh, one problem with this is, Round of efficiency, we go back to electricity is only about 40%. So we take our costly renewable electricity, make it hydrogen, put it back into a gas turbine or a fuel cell, and then we only get about 20 percent of that out. So I personally don't think that's a good viable option. I think we should focus on using it for heat or transport instead. And the last option would be biomass. So the question of how much biomass do we have? <coughs> Some people say about 25% indigenous sources, so we can 20, cover 25% of our heating demand, but then we couldn't use it for anything else. Um, other uses will be electricity production with carbon capture and storage, have negative emissions, uh, transport fuel or feedstock or the chemical industry. So currently, the, I think the biggest single source of renewable energy in the UK is Drax Power Station, which has three of their units converted to biomass. And uh, yeah, it's 2.3 million tons of biomass per year, most of it imported from the US. So wouldn't that be a better use to uh, use that biomass for heating or other things with a slightly higher efficiency than 40%? They claim 40%, which is the efficiency the unit had with coal. So um, I'm not sure I believe this number completely. <laughs> okay, so we went through quite a few options of, of seasonal storage. Um, all of some advantages and disadvantages, of the, the cheapest one would be sensible, the thermal energy storage. Round efficiency only about 50%, but it has worked quite well in Canada and Denmark, and I think there's quite a lot of scope in some areas, so you obviously it will be hard to have this in, in the city center, so you might have it in new built areas or in villages. The other thermal energy storage, Options latent thermal chemical have high efficiencies, but the costs are much more excessive. So they would be better used not for seasonal storage, but for short-term storage or maybe medium-term storage. And then there's something which I think hopefully will come as power to gas to heat and biomass potentially as direct combustion, or so you can do biogas to heat. Well, there's quite a lot of potential there. And then these last ones are not applicable everywhere. We only have about five minutes left. So these are the traditional options. So the last one is, can we integrate it with, with renewables slightly better? So this is a slightly optimistic plot on the left here. On the blue one, is the, the daily wind over three or four years in the UK. That's always the wind energy is much higher in winter. Still, massive variations during the days or the weeks. And the red one is the heat demand. So there's a follow quite similar trend. These curves are normalized, so the heat variation is about 2 terawatt hours per day. The wind variation is only about 0 0.06 terawatt hours per day. 
uh, this is for 7 gigawatt meter capacity and projections for 2050 range from anywhere between 20 and almost 200 gigawatt of wind in the system in the UK. So this value would increase quite a lot. So the question, do we need seasonal storage? Can we maybe have a tighter integration of wind, potentially wave in the UK, and our heating system? And then maybe we just need weekly or monthly storage, so we only need to store for two weeks instead of for seven months. And also potentially, can wind heat generation reduce wind constraint payments, which have been going up in the UK quite significantly. And in the UK, uh, the UK in Germany, Aeon already has some uh, basically giant boilers, electric boilers, resistive heaters, where they use spare wind electricity to heat the water to store them for the district heating networks. So, <coughs> we had this picture before. So the conventional energy system where you know, not, no big connection between heat, electricity and transport. Probably in the future it will probably look a bit more like this. I probably missed a few lines as well. All the dashed ones are new. So the biomass, we get a biomass waste classification feeds into gas grid, power to gas, uh, waste, so there can be biomass waste classification, waste incineration, crystal heat, internal storage. There's a lot of more interaction between the two between the systems. And the Danish are moving slightly into this, but obviously they're coming from a different field. And in the UK, I think this is where we need to go in the next decades. So I did some very simple calculation just matching wind output to the UK to heater and thermal energy storage to see how much storage you would need to use all the wind. So on a domestic house, so we, for each house we would need about one megawatt hour of storage. Uh, so one megawatt hour gives about 50 to 70 percent utilization of the wind just for heating. So we uh, neglected electricity in this respect. So one megawatt hour of storage per, per household is still quite a lot in normal hot water tanks about well, 10 kilowatt hours of storage. So we would need, so this, this simple case is obviously not the solution, but uh, this is only about two hours, two weeks of storage of winter demand. It's less than the uh, six megawatt we had before, megawatt hours, sorry. So uh, it's something slightly more complex, and this is sort of work in progress where we look at the uh, hydrothermal system. So this is for a remote location, so I did it for a Scottish island, which is not grid connected, which normally gets their electricity from diesel generators. And if we integrate wind turbines and batteries to get to fulfill the electricity demand, but then also use electricity with heat pumps to fulfill the heat demand, so then we have to integrate some thermal storage and some auxiliary boiler, which also runs on uh, uh, diesel or oil to fill this to fulfill this demand. So the idea is that we have more wind in the system than we need for electricity and use a spare one which is with heat pumps either to fulfill the demand directly or to store it. So this is some preliminary results where the system just from wind receives about 90% of the electricity without any battery storage. The rest is provided by the diesel and Oh, this is slightly, so we have about four times the electricity demand from wind. So if we have an electricity demand of uh, one gigawatt hour, we have four gigawatt hours of wind in the system. So the, the heating demand is, is higher than the electricity demand, so we still waste a lot of heat due to the standing losses of the thermal energy storage, particularly in summer. But we can integrate that with thermal energy storage systems like phase change or thermal chemicals, which have lower standing losses. This might be a quite good option for this sort of ongoing work. Okay. Okay, so I think a few conclusions first. <coughs> Thanks to uh, the PhDs and Rinaldi, who did a lot of the work on the modeling of the thermal storage, and George, who helped me with the hybrid system. And I hope I convinced you that it's a, it's a big problem. We need to tackle, but there's also quite a lot of uh, opportunities due to the distributed nation, uh, nature, which links quite well to the renewables, and potentially there's quite quite a good overlap between heat demand and wind, so we can utilize that better and integrate everything better. I hope we can come up with a 
maybe not good, but satisfactory solution. So thank you for your attention. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.